Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Switch. My name is Patty Hampton, and I am excited about this week's topic. Did you know that nonprofit HR has served thousands of mission-driven organizations over the past 20 years? This episode is all about how organizations can prepare for existing and new regulations with the Family's First Act and beyond. Listen in as Lisa McEwen, Managing Director of Nonprofit HR's Total Rewards Practice, and Eric Selliers, Senior Human Resources Business Partner and Benefits, share what your organization can do now to remain compliant during and post-pandemic. Share this production in your communities and download the slides and transcript. Visit nonprofithr.com forward slash the switch for a video recording, presentation, and other assets. Without further ado, here's Lisa and Eric. So thank you for joining us this afternoon. And thank you, Eric, for partnering with me on ensuring that we have um, the latest information in these different areas. So the most critical and most uh, relevant piece of information is the Families First Coronavirus Response Act that was just released. And there's guidance coming out about that every day. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that and also some steps that you need to take now to ensure that your uh, leave programs are ready to go. Um, some HIPAA and ADA considerations, particularly around um, staff that um, might be coming in ill or are working and are ill. And of course, workers' compensation and unemployment, just uh, giving a bit of an update on how those are currently working, given the current context of the coronavirus pandemic. And then, of course, we'll have some question and answers. This event was originally recorded as a nonprofit HR webinar. Check out other nonprofit HR events and virtual learning opportunities opportunities at nonprofithr.com forward slash events. So the first bit of information we wanted to share with you is the big picture around the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. We have several slides coming up that go into the different pieces of this act that Eric will go into detail on. But just some of the relevant information that you need to know about it is that it does apply to the private sector, including nonprofits and governmental entities that employ fewer than 500 employees. We do know that there could be some subsequent um, regulations relating to employers that have less than 50 employees who may later be deemed exempt. But at the current time, we know that all employers with fewer than 500 employees are covered by this new act. The act does require that employers provide emergency paid family and sick leave, and we'll talk a little bit about that. It also requires all group health plans to cover COVID testing without any employee cost sharing. So any diagnostic testing um, is required that it be covered. There's also um, new regulations that are actually coming out, even some this morning, that will talk about um, guidance given out about how employers can um, be provided refundable tax credit against their employer portion of social security taxes to ensure that you are covered 100% for any cost that your organization has in covering these benefits. And of course, um, there's also gonna be a link to the legislation. Um, there's also some new, better, easier, more you know, user-friendly guidance that's also been provided um, that we'll, we'll talk a little about as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to Eric to start getting into some of the details about it. Thank you, Lisa. I'm going to walk us through the key provisions today of the emergency paid family leave and the paid sick leave. And then um, I will also talk about some, some tips, some suggestions to give to employers to help them ready and make themselves uh, you know, in, in a good position to become compliant with, with this act. So first, let's talk about the emergency paid family leave. This leave does go in effect as of April 2nd, and it will run through the end of the year. And then some of the key provisions here that we're going to talk about, employees must be employed at least 30 days to be eligible. And this leave is used to provide job protection and up to 12 weeks of paid leave for any employee with a COVID-19 qualifying event. And that event is um, the employee can't work or telework due to an illness or they have the children at home. You know, the daycare center is not available or child care. And, and it's, it's those events that allow the employees to qualify for the emergency paid family leave. 
The leave, um, up to the first 10 days of the leave can be unpaid. It's not required, but employers are allowed to do that. After that, the employee will receive uh, two thirds of their regular rate of pay. That cannot, of course, go below minimum wage. The leave payments on this type of leave are capped at $200 per day. And there is also an aggregate of $10,000 total for the total duration of this leave. Finally, as Lisa mentioned a minute ago, there are several spots throughout this legislation where the door has been left open to sort of allow, um, you know, regulators to, to come in later on and make some exemptions and, you know, further square some of this stuff up. And this, this last point is one of those. So first responders or healthcare workers, they may not be required to provide this leave. That is, that is still outstanding in a similar way as the less than 50 employers. So look for further guidance from, um, from the regulatory bodies later on for that. Now let's talk about the emergency paid sick leave. Again, this one um, is effective April 2nd, runs through the end of the year. And one of the um, most important things to point off right off the bat, there's no length of service requirement on this leave. So you can have an employee that hires today and, and next week, if, if that employee qualifies for this paid sick leave, that employee is eligible to participate in this emergency plan. The benefit is for full-time employees, they can receive up to 80 hours, and part-time employees will receive the average of their hours worked over a prior two-week period. The benefit is capped at $511 per day, and for those caring for others, it's capped at $200 per day. Each of those also has an aggregate total that you would want to track to be able to you know, stop that benefit um, at that time. So one thing that we want to point out is this, this leave is in addition to any leave programs that you already have in place. And you, you are not able to force employees to take um, one type of leave, you know, your, your type of leave before taking this one. Notice of the benefit must be shared with employees, and that notice is still going to be coming out from the Department of Labor. It was ex it's expected no later than March 25th. The Coronavirus Respirants Act, it also requires some changes to group health plans, and this applies to both fully and self-insured plans. The change is that the plans must now cover the cost of COVID-19 testing without any employee cost sharing, prior authorization, or any other medical management restrictions. So this includes the coverages for diagnostic testing products, items and services provided to an individual during healthcare provider office visits, and that does include telehealth visits as well, urgent care center visits, and emergency room visits that basically all, all of this is saying if it results in, in your need of taking a test that the plan, the plan covers that cost in full. So here, here are some things that you can do now to, to ready um, your organization to comply with this act. So as, as we mentioned, there are um, sometimes the benefit payment is 100%, other times it's two thirds. So you might wanna consider creating some new earnings codes or, or um, pay codes in your payroll system. Um, I have done leave management in-house for, for organizations and I would recommend maybe right off the bat reaching out to your, your payroll provider and find out if maybe they're already working on this for you. Um, it could be that, you know, since every, every organ, not every organization, but uh, quite a few organizations will be required to do this, it could be possible that they're already working on a set of codes that they might roll out to all their clients. In the event they're not, then you would need to, you know, decide if um, that if you've got enough time and resources to do that on your own. So all of these tips are, are kind of going to, you want to have to think about what's the size of your organization, what's your resources, how many employees are um, impacted. And some of those things will help guide you to determine whether or not you need to do um, more automated solutions. If you have, you know, if you're an organization that's up in the three and 400 lives, that would be something uh, probably difficult to do if you were trying to track some of these things manually. So all of these all of these tips do kind of fall into that that mindset where you need to determine you know what's best for your organization. But some of the things that I that I thought would be helpful but with these codes, it's going to help you track the payments that you make to employees under these benefits. So you're going to have to, you know, earlier we talked about there's caps on the benefit. When you set up earnings codes, you can configure those to where, you know, they have accumulators on them and they're keeping track of the total amount of benefit paid under them. It might make it easier for you to later run reports and kind of determine where employees are sitting um, versus, you know, having to go back and look at, at pay stubs. 
Another thing that I see pretty essential in having codes is since these benefits um, are not subject to the normal 6.2% Social Security tax, you're, you're going to need to have some way to be able to run those particular benefit payments through your payroll system such that they're not going to be taxed. Now, that's certainly something that, you know, you can accomplish in setting up a new pay code. Um, if Again, if you don't have the time or resource or it doesn't seem feasible that you're going to be able to do that timely, you would have to, you know, talk to your, your payroll provider, come up with some, some strategy to be able to account for that and back it back out later on. If your organization doesn't create new codes, alternate means will be needed to, to process these benefits. You could do Excel sheets, um, maybe run a census from your system and get all of your eligible employees, and you could put the number of hours that they qualify for and sort of use that as a, a rudimentary way to keep track of who's taking what and uh, what they have remaining and, and also like keep a track of that aggregate as well. So the, uh, the method by which the organizations choose to, do, to track these benefits and I mentioned, obviously, if you've got the time and your, your payroll provider can help you, that's probably the, the preferred method. If, if not, you know, the, the spreadsheet certainly would work. And you, you need to consider how your employees will request these benefits. Um, it could be right now that in, with your in-house programs, it's already programmed into your system and maybe they go out to a um, self-service page and they they request like vacation or sick. It goes to a manager for approval and then it goes into your payroll system. If you're not able to get these plans set up in your system, then you, you're going to need to have some type of manual process that you're going to use. And you would you would want to sit down as you know an organization, determine how that's going to be done and then communicate it out to your to your workforce. You have been listening to The Switch, a nonprofit HR podcast on powering your people with talent management insights, best practices, and hacks. Looking for a thought partner to help you integrate talent into your mission's strategic plan? Well, the good news is nonprofit HR has solutions to meet your unique talent management needs. Strategic planning is an annual ritual for many nonprofits, yet countless organizations plan for programs and fundraising without thinking about the talent needed to meet those goals and ultimately their mission. With more than 20 years of expertise under our belt and the bench strength of credentialed consultants, we partner with all mission types and offer solutions that span project-based human resources consulting and outsourcing, search, total rewards, and DEI. Join the community of social impact organizations that have trusted nonprofit HR to help them achieve their full potential through their people. And I'm now going to turn it over to Lisa. She's going to talk about HIPAA and ADA considerations. Yeah, thank you, Eric. I just wanted to point out here, the Department of Labor, the IRS, and the Treasury Department are really, they are issuing guidance now on how you can claim any of the tax credits that you'll be able to file with your quarterly taxes. So the tracking mechanism is important, not only to ensure that employees are getting paid, but it will be your way to be able to file for any tax credits that you may be due when you file quarterly taxes. So it's just another reason to sort of come up with some mechanism that will work um, as well for tracking when you're filing quarterly taxes to make sure that you're, you're getting um, reimbursed for these programs as well. So some of the other things that we wanted to talk about, and it's in, it's important to remember overall that a lot of the regulations that are already in place, so HIPAA and ADA and a lot of the other, you know, Fair Labor Standards Act, it's important to know that those things are still in place and that we still have to adhere to them as organizations. Um, so we wanted to just take a, a little bit of time to talk a little bit about some of the situations that might be coming up and you're wondering, you know, what should we do? So we've come up with a couple of scenarios. So just to talk briefly that HIPAA um, essentially covers medical records that are maintained by healthcare providers and health plans. Um, but ADA is the Civil Rights Act that prohibits discrimination based on a disability. And so there's a couple of considerations to keep in mind when you might have an, an employee that is either sick and that employer should notify their workforce of a potential exposure that it is okay to do that. And it is okay for employers to ask a potentially ill employee to go home. 
And this hasn't changed. There are other health situations that may occur you know, prior to this pandemic where it would have been appropriate to ask a potentially ill employee to go home. And so it's just reinforcing that if you do have an employee, if you have to stay open, if you are an essential business, and you need to stay open and you do have employees coming in. If employees, other employees are coming to you concerned about a potential employee that might be ill, it is okay to go talk to the employee and ask them to go home. And other questions that we've received around this, if someone is, one of our employees is in, and they're sick and they go to the hospital um, and they, someone, their loved one calls and asks for, you know, they don't know their health insurance name or the plan number, is it okay for sharing that? And yes, it is okay uh, to share, you know, the health plan name and the plan number with a loved one for purposes of ensuring that the employee, you know, gets coverage, their loved one gets coverage, and that anything that needs to be paid does get paid. Things that you need to keep in mind is don't identify or include any details that would permit any means of identifying the ill employee and the practice of requesting a potentially ill employee go home. You just need to make sure that you're applying that consistently. So if other employees are also ill, um, it's, it's important that you're applying that anyone who's ill go home, just apply that across the board. And lastly, it's important that if you don't, and many of you probably already have this at, uh, readily available, but if not, make sure you have your employee um, emergency and contact information readily available. And it's also, since a lot of us may be working remotely, for those who have responsibilities for ensuring that you know benefits management have readily available sort of all the, the medical plan number, if you have more than one plan, the names of the plans and the plan numbers readily available just in case somebody needs them. So there's also been a lot of changes related to what states are doing around workers' compensation. So, <clears throat> excuse me, absent any state legislation changes that may be happening, employee seeking workers' comp for a coronavirus infection, they still need to provide medical evidence to support this claim that they've contracted coronavirus at work. So the regulations around workers' compensation have not changed. And I've been monitoring sort of federal there's nothing that's changing about this yet. So absent any state legislation, anyone, you know, any employee who has still needs to prove that they've re that they have contracted the infection as part of work. Generally, if an employee is a healthcare worker or a forced responder, though, they will likely be able to file and receive workers' compensation. It will be probably more easy for them to prove that they've received it at work, particularly if they're caring for those. But in this instance, I I would make sure that you're keeping track of um, and watching any alerts coming out from your state governments where you are located uh, because states may do things differently and just it's very important to make sure that you're staying on top of those alerts. So unemployment. There is a lot, a lot going on with unemployment insurance, particularly on different state levels. There is um, guidance that was released on March 2nd by the Department of Labor that is allowing flexibilities in states in administering their unemployment insurance. Um, and under this guidance, the federal law is permitting, again, significant flexibilities for states to amend their law, state laws to provide unemployment benefits. Um, due to multiple scenarios related to the coronavirus. The first is if an employer temporarily ceases operations due to COVID-19, preventing employees from coming to work, then they may be able to file for unemployment. If an individual is quarantined with the expectation of returning to work after the quarantine is over, then those staff would be able to um, file for unemployment. Um, and an individual leaves employment due to a risk or exposure or to care for a family member, they may also be able to apply for unemployment. It still will be up to each state to determine um, whether or not these circumstances would be approved for unemployment. So it's very important to check with your State Department of Labor to see what their requirements are and what accommodations have been made. Um, it's recommended that any employee that is affected by reduced hours or shutting down of an operation, apply for unemployment benefits. I am uh, from the state of Massachusetts, and my Department of Unemployment actually held a town hall yesterday on Sunday at 3.30. So unemployment offices are starting to 
do virtual town halls, send out alerts, and you may not be aware of them or your employees may not be aware of them if they haven't recently filed for unemployment. So it's good as an employer to um, make sure that you're, again, receiving alerts and staying up to date with the guidance that your states are issuing because it may be different or more flexible than what the um, federal regulations are. So there are some important takeaways that we want you to remember. We absolutely would like you to encourage your employees to use telemedicine um, for physical and mental health needs. I know that in many states, state mental health departments and Department of Public Health, they are asking for mental health providers to volunteer and cover hotlines to, to help with the needs, the mental health and of needs of, in, of staff or employees and workers within the state that are actually staying home and they're quarantined and they're isolated. Um, so we, we really do encourage your employees to use telemedicine for physical and uh, mental health needs. And absolutely, if you have to stay open, if you have any employees who are potentially ill, send them home. And um, it's best to make sure that they reach out to their doctor, check the CDC for additional information um, regarding uh, anything about the illness and make sure that they're staying, again, staying in touch with their doctor for that. Um, it's really important that across all of your employment practices um, that you be consistent. So again, if you're sending one employee home and not another or vice versa, it's really important that you be consistent across all of your practices during the coronavirus pandemic. We are starting to hear about potential legal actions against employees who are not being sent home or are being sent home. So it's important that you just make sure your practices are very consistent. It's also really important to know that the Families First Coronavirus Response Act and those emergency leave programs do begin April 2nd. There is guidance that was recently sent out that there'll be you know, a period of time, 30 days after April 2nd, where you'll be able to, you know, putting your best efforts and your best um, practices forward so that if you get ready a little after April 2nd, um, that's okay, but they're, they're really insistent upon, you know, leaves can begin to be taken and you need to have your leave programs and any earning codes ready to go. But there's a little bit of a grace period if you need some time to get that up and running, but it's best to be prepared by April 2nd because employees could start taking them now or prior to that. You're listening to The Switch. Follow along with this podcast. Download the slides and other visual materials at nonprofithr.com forward slash The Switch. So we want to again remind everybody about the important websites and trust, trustworthy resources. So absolutely, the CDC for um, domestic and international travel notices, the CDC COVID-19 webpage, and the World Health Organization webpage as well. Um, you can continue to get updates from whatever news sources um, you like to use. Your local news sources are also very important to be keeping in touch with what's happening in your community, in your local towns, and in your state. There's some other sites that are available. So the DC Metro has a pandemic task force, the state of Maryland's Department of Health, the Virginia Department of Health. And I would also encourage all of you calling from different states other than those to make sure that you sign up for alerts through your governor's office, through your Department of Public Health office. They all have alerts that are available now um, so that you can get information. I know that in Massachusetts, our governor is doing daily briefings and there's an alert system that I've signed up for to be um, kept up to date on things as well. And also please go to the nonprofit.com portal. As information becomes available, we are digesting it. We're reading through it. We are trying to make it um, get the information that is most relevant for you to hear as employers. And we are putting that information on our website and we're also sending out email blasts to let you know when information is up to date as well on that site. All of the information that we have talked about today and then additional information, we have created one pagers that are available on our website. So they are around HIPAA 
and ADA in COVID-19. There's one pages on telemedicine, on employment insurance, workers' compensation, wage and hour issues. And there's also a very detailed, um, it's more than one pager because there's a big, it's a big act, but there is, um, it's summarized really nicely, uh, the family's first coronavirus response act. So it's, you can go to the website and pull these one pages out, share them out with your, um, with your employees. Please share them with other, other organizations, your colleagues that might need additional guidance. We are monitoring all of the news that is happening, any changes that are happening with federal regulations. We are creating one pages and providing as up-to-date information as possible on our website to assist you as you learn, you know, how to respond to this within your own organization. And I'm going to turn it back over to Alicia, but I, I want to thank you for listening in. I hope it was helpful. And Alicia, hopefully there's a lot of questions out there. There probably is. And we're here, Eric and I are here to answer them. Great. Thank you, Lisa and Eric, for all this great information. We definitely have a lot of questions. Okay, so what does this mean for those states and localities that have already called for mandatory closures of all non-essential work since the new act doesn't become effective until April 2nd? Eric? In those situations, if your employees, you know, assuming that, you, you know, any, no one hasn't been laid off, if they're still active employees, I, I think they would still qualify. And probably this is probably something I need to get um, some more research on and get back with that question. Somebody asked about, a couple of people asked about contractors um, and how this, uh, does any of this apply to them if they are not employees? Yeah, um, there's no language within the act that refers to contractors. It's just for um, employee, actual employees of organizations. So these acts do not apply. Okay, and then how about if you have a staff member um, who is older and has some chronic health issues that may make him or her more susceptible to take advantage of the paid leave. Are they able to take advantage of it based on their condition? You know, that's a really good question. And I think that's sort of, it's sort of in a gray area because if they are not displaying any symptoms of having coronavirus and they are an essential employee and want to continue to work, I don't think you can make that employee go home. Should they decide they want to go home, I think they do you know, show some symptoms or be diagnosed, but also if some employees are actually sent home. But if they're not, if they're an essential employee and they aren't showing any symptoms and they're still coming to work, I don't believe that just wanting to avoid it, but the employer has not necessarily quarantined or shut down or deemed that some workers aren't essential, even though the business may be essential. I don't think you can really do anything to have that employee stay home if you've deemed other employees with similar roles um, and similar responsibilities are also working. It's a bit of a gray area, um, but that would be, you know, my best guidance around that would be that um, unless they're displaying any symptoms, um, I wouldn't make them go home. And if the employee wants to go home because they are of a vulnerable state, I think it's going to be, you know, they have maybe a, an immune order um, deficiency or they're a bit older, I think it's going to be up to the employer to determine if they'll allow them to take um, sick leave because that circumstance is not specifically called out in the regulations. Okay. And then we have another question um, asking about um, when you have employees with children at home because of school closures um, and the employees are teleworking, is there any um, age or other requirement to say that you can't, age of the children, I guess, so to say that you can't work from home? So is there any restriction there is the first question. And then the second question is, if you can work from home um, and still do some work, is there any ability to take intermittent leave through the FMLA usage? I, I've seen other um, practitioners and, and, you know, asking this question as well. I think that's something that's still probably going to be uh, firmed up and, and later guidance will be uh, to put out on that as far as like whether it could be done intermittently. Uh, obviously, you know, Congress wanted to get 
the law pass as quickly as possible to to start providing some relief. And some of those, you know, as we mentioned earlier, some of those doors are kind of open for them to still, you know, step in and later, you know, firm some of those things up. As far as the first part of the question, I have not seen anything that specifically mentions an age. I, I've, I've just seen, you know, that the, the family leave is provided for em, employees that need to uh, take care of, of a child due to the either the school is closed or the child care is not available. Right. Okay, and related to that question, um, is em- the emergency FMLA leave separate from other FMLA leave already in place for an employee? It is separate, yes. Okay, great. I, I just want to add to the previous question that I think for the employee that might that can still work virtually but has children at home, I think um, maybe it's you know it's important to think about you know flexibility and allowing you know maybe work hours to be a little bit different if that's possible uh, while someone's at home. So thinking a little bit more less about nine to five and perhaps giving a little bit more flexibility because sometimes it's two the two parents are both trying to work virtually as well. So. So I think a little bit of flexibility um, might be helpful in that situation, too. Okay, great. Um, somebody with from an employer with less than 50 employees is asking if there's any, what is the probability that additional regulations will be put in place for employers under 50, um, with under 50 employees, just so that they know since they're trying to put this all into place, it's likely that they will still be subject to these regulations. Right. It's, it's going to be hard to provide like a, a probability in, in a number format. Um, what I have been reading is they've, they've left the door open such that um, the Department of Labor and the Treasury and, you know, those other governing bodies can later decide um, to offer the means by which those employers can come forward and request exemption if participating and providing these benefits, you know, basically causes um, a hardship on their business. This is something that I've read. They're, they're expecting to provide some guidance later in April. But um, at, at the moment, it's, it's really hard to you know, predict how, how likely that is to happen. But my, my assumption is since it's been placed in there, they've mentioned there's further guidance. I, I would think there's probably going to be some. I just don't know what that looks like and, and who will be scooped up in that net. Okay, and then shifting over to um, asking or requesting employees to identify if they or a loved one has been diagnosed or come in contact with a confirmed or suspected case, they just wanted to confirm that you can indeed ask that and the employer can track that information. Is that not if the employee says they have symptoms, but if they come forward and say they've been in contact with someone, or can the employer ask if the employee has been in contact? I think it's the general... um, just confirming that an employer may ask all employees if they're diagnosed or if somebody in their household or somebody they're close to yes, has been they diagnosed. Can, yes, they can that generally you. ask that question to all, and that could be something that's in their um, their plan to ensure that somebody can be notified, um, that employer employees have someone they can notify. Should they either feel symptoms themselves or have come into contact, yes, employers can ask that they do that, absolutely. You have been listening to The Switch, a nonprofit HR podcast on powering your people with talent management insights, best practices, and hacks. Looking for a thought partner to help you integrate talent into your mission strategic plan? Well, the good news is nonprofit HR has solutions to meet your unique talent management needs. Strategic planning is an annual ritual for many nonprofits, yet countless organizations plan for programs and fundraising without thinking about the talent needed to meet those goals and ultimately their mission. With more than 20 years of expertise under our belt and the bench strength of credentialed consultants, We partner with all mission types and offer solutions that span project-based human resources, consulting, and outsourcing, search, total rewards, and DEI. Join the community of social impact organizations that have trusted nonprofit HR to help them achieve their full potential through their people. Okay, and then this is also shifting gears a little bit on employees who are furloughed or are inactive due to furloughs or layoffs um, about issues raised by continuing health insurance coverage. So what do people need to do um, with respect to continuing health insurance coverage for those who are right. active? 
So under um, some guidance just came out on this this morning. So any employees, you know, if the employer has to furlough all or part of their staff, they do have to offer COBRA to those employees. So COBRA is still in place and still has to be offered um, to any employees that are furloughed. Okay, and then I think this was somewhat covered before, but I'm just going to repeat it in case we didn't get all of it. Um, if you're providing paid leave to some employees before April 2nd for COVID-19 reasons, can they can the employer still claim the reimbursement? I believe yes. Yes, they can. And then in terms of workers' compensation, are food workers that might have been exposed, are they eligible? Yeah, any employee or worker that can prove, so that's the key, they have to be able to prove that they contracted coronavirus at work. So if someone comes into work with coronavirus and, and other employees then get sick and those employees can prove that they were sick at work, then yes, that, that would be considered um, eligible for workers' compensation. Okay. And then could you also um, speak to short-term disability related to COVID-19? So, I mean, short-term disability, I, I'm guessing the question might have to do with either coordinating benefits or, or just what that looks like. You know, keep in mind that the, the benefits under the, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, those are all related to COVID. Um, it, it could be a situation where um, if you have an in-house disability plan that, that your employee would be able to make a claim there as well. We're, we're still trying to, you know, put together some guidance on how to coordinate those, and it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis at each organization organization, you know, depending upon what programs you may already have in place, what programs might the state be offering, and then also with this federal as well. But um, there, there could potentially be cases where you do have employees that, um, you know, might be able to, to qualify for a couple of different benefit plans. So I, I, I'm not sure if the question is asking, you know, would they be able to also get benefit there or how it would coordinate. But yeah, I, I do think, you know, it would be possible for them to, you know, make a claim there as well. And, uh, you know, we could potentially give you some guidance on how to coordinate those benefits. Thank you. I think it was just, you know, making sure it's all part of this as well, if, if available. Um, and then you might have mentioned this but related to um, signal notice to employees about this new, these new regulations. Um, I believe you said that you thought one was coming out. Is that correct? Correct. It's expected by March the 25th. It'll probably be similar to some of the other notices that, you know, when, when paid sick leave laws go into effect in different, you know, um, state or localities, you usually publish those and post them on the wall next year, other, you know, HR type publications. And usually you, you also distribute that amongst the staff. So my, my assumption would be that once this is released, there will probably be guidance issued at that same time, you know, explaining to employers what they need to do and uh, to, to be compliant with with making employees aware of, of the act. Okay. And then there's a question about the family's first requirements about paying two thirds of someone's pay up to $200 a day. So if you have a higher paid employee, do you have to pay them at the lesser rate or can they pay their normal salary? And then what do they get to claim um, back in terms of taxes? So at first you would, you would, you would take the benefit under the uh, family's first act and you would do the two thirds. That's that's the portion that the employer is going to be able to later, um, you know, do a credit of, of some of these things with the IRS that Lisa was talking about earlier. The the employer certainly could choose to to top that off, but you know, this is where those earning codes would come into hand. You you want to be able once once this is said and done at, at the end of each quarter or however you, however the IRS provides guidance on making these credits, you want to be able to determine which part of the benefit under the Families First Act is going to qualify qualify for you to get reimbursement, you know, take, take some offsets on those taxes versus what you top off as a company. Okay. And then somebody asked if you're asked if you're able to screen employees for symptoms such as requiring temperature checks. Yeah, you know, um, that is not recommended. It, it's really not recommended that you do temperature checks on employees. I've seen different guidance on that. Um, it just seems to fall into an area that because those who are checking the temperatures, unless they're medical personnel, people have fevers for different reasons or people have different temperatures. So there's the possibility of um, not getting an accurate reading. And so it is generally recommended that you, that you don't do temperature checks for those reasons. There is a possibility that regulations around 
temperature check may change. So we'll we'll see if there's any guidance on that. And, and because some of these things, they change very, uh, very quickly and ad hoc. So if there's guidance around that that has changed, um, we'll be sure to get that out. Okay, thank you. Um, so if an employee is diagnosed with um, COVID-19, how can you give the rest of the staff enough information um, that those with close contact can self-quarantine? If we can't release the name, how do you handle that? I think I think the recommendation that I would give is that those who are aware of who the employee is would be able to work with and know who they were closest to and then give guidance around that. But it is you know, it you can't you can't identify the person, but you can certainly say, you know, if you are in, you know, a particular area of the building or you can work through um, the manager um, who may know who that person or the employee themselves can identify who they have been in touch with. Uh, in what areas they have been, so they can alert alert certain employees. But yet, you're not really you're not able to identify that individual in any type of a communication. So hopefully, if you have somebody that does have symptoms or self-identify, it's really important to get information from that employee, so you can make sure that you can pass information on to others who were potentially exposed. Okay, thank you. And then can you clarify, um, there were restrictions, uh, eligibility requirements for sick leave and the family leave. Um, one was 30 days and one did not have a length of service requirement. Can you um, clarify what those were one more time? And then if you don't distinguish between paid time off and sick time, how would that affect your nonprofit? So the, the first part of the question um, for the emergency paid family leave, and again, that is the leave that uh, you would offer to employees when they um, can't work or telework due to needing to take care of a child because of the schools closed, et cetera. That one has, um, you have to, the employee has to have worked for at least 30 days to be eligible. And the emergency paid sick leave, and that's the one where you, you get up to 80 hours of sick time if you're um, a full time and then you get the average of your two, you know, what, what you normally work over a two-week period if you're part-time. That one does not have any length of service requirement whatsoever. So that's the one where you could hire today and next week if if these things, you know, if a COVID type of event happens to you, you would qualify for that sick time. Um, Alicia, could you repeat the second part of the question, please? Sure. If, um, if you don't distinguish between sick time and paid time off, how would you separate the two? Um, so if, first of all, if you think about that the government is going to allow organizations to uh, basically they're they're they're, fun, they're creating a way to re reimburse businesses somewhat by by taking the the amount that you're paying under these leave plans as as the credits on the on the taxes. So if you don't have if you're not distinguishing between the two of these, I I think it might make it more difficult when it comes time to start taking those credits. Again, that guidance is is forthcoming. Uh, the IRS, as Lisa mentioned, has started to publish something, but it, it's it's still all, all very new. But I, I think it would be I wouldn't recommend anyone trying to pay, you know, these benefits under existing codes or, or, or using a single code. I, I think it would just be a, a hard thing to manage, especially since there are times when you're paying two thirds of an employee's rate. So typically these leave codes, when you're paying them in a payroll system, you're entering a number of hours. It's, you know, taking those hours times the, the employee's rate and producing the, the benefit. So, um, you know, in order to get a code to do two thirds of that rate, it's going to have to have some configuration done. So I, I think you would want to separate it for, for multiple reasons. Okay. And then we have a question about paperwork um, needed for an employee to take FMLA under this act. Is there any requirement um, similar to what is required for FMLA normally? I haven't seen anything, um, you know, specifically for for COVID. As, as as far as you know, under under normal FMLA, you would have to get the the doctor certification form and that type of thing. Um, I have not seen that. So this is this is somewhat an extension of of FMLA. But all of the regulations that that we've been reviewing and studying, there's there's been no mention of of any paper adjudication trail, you know, to determine whether for this is valid or not. I, I think it's going to have to be, um, you know, employer employers are going to have to, you know, good faith efforts on their employees. And uh, all we have is what we have here published so far. I wanted to go back to the person that asked about the um, temperature check. There was guidance that was just issued by the um, EEOC 
that does allow employers to check temperatures. And they've allowed that because the Centers for Disease Control and state and local health authorities, you know, have acknowledged the community spread of COVID-19. Um, but just to be aware that when you are doing that, some people that do have COVID-19 don't yet have a fever and may not have a fever. And then again, those people that do have a fever may not have COVID-19. So just be aware of that. If you do decide to start checking employers' temperatures, you can do that. But how much of a, of a help could it be when fevers can or cannot exist for different reasons? So You're listening to The Switch. Follow along with this podcast. Download the slides and other visual materials at nonprofithr.com forward slash the switch. Okay, great. Um, and the sick leave and the emergency family leave can run concurrently, correct? Yes, it's, it's essentially sort of how it was sort of, I guess, intended. That's why the first two weeks of the family, the paid the emergency paid family leave can go unpaid. Um, the thought was that you have those uh, two weeks, those 80 hours of the paid sick time um, up front. Okay. What about in states where we have been asked to close non-essential businesses? How do these things impact there? Right. That's similar to the first question that um, stumped me right off the bat. Um, it's something that I have been trying to to read as, you know, as Lisa's been answering some questions, I, I've yet to find anything. Uh, I mean, just thinking out loud, it's 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 something that I, I think maybe it wasn't thought of initially. Um, you know, everything's a lot of moving parts, but going to have to find out if the state has ordered that your business is shut. I, I really don't. I, you know, I, I would hate to speculate on, on the answer. We really just need to research that one. I apologize. To add to that, em employers who are or states where they have only essential businesses can work, those employees are essentially furloughed. And um, unless their employer is, you know, where they can work virtually and they're continuing to be paid in that way, or perhaps they're furloughed and unable to work, they can file for unemployment. Okay, thank you. And then somebody was asking kind of a follow-up question to um, the questions we discussed about um, employees with children at home or not in childcare or school. Is there an opportunity, because they may not be able to make up all the hours, is there an opportunity to do kind of partial, you know, partial work and then partial unpaid leave under the Families First Act? Well, I mean, the Families First Act is, is talking about paid leave. So, you know, the question you mentioned about unpaid leave. So could the employees, could they do some work and take some unpaid leave? Is that the, is that the nature of the question? Oh, I'm sorry. If they, so if they can be paid for the time they work and then get paid leave under the Family First Act. I guess. Right. So that's that's back to the intermittent question. A lot of different practitioners have been asking that on on the boards. I've been monitoring. Uh, again, there there isn't anything that's been issued that directly um, addresses this yet. So I again, I kind of hate to say that it could be done, but my hunch is that it probably would be allowed. But at, at the moment, there's nothing that's been been actually published, you know, addressing how employers could allow the, these things to work intermittently. Okay, and then do you recommend that employers create a new and separate FMLA COVID-19 policy? I, I think that at minimum, you know, I think it's always a good idea when, when you're starting to pay some new programs in-house that you, you kind of meet as, as your HR leadership team and, and write out how you plan to, you know, do some of these things. Um, as far as, as a full-blown policy, I, I suspect that this notice that is coming out from, um, you know, Health and Human Services and Department of Labor might be enough for that. I mean, Lisa, do you have anything to add there? Do you have any opinion on whether they should create a new policy? I, I would not, actually. I don't. The, the basic tenets of federal family leave they have not changed. I think this is just to respond to an emergency situation. So you may want to focus your energy on um, understanding the regulations around these emergency leave programs. And I would encourage you to actually use our one pagers that are posted. If you'd like to educate employees about these programs, they are there on the website and, and free for everybody to use. But I wouldn't recommend at this point that you worry about creating new leave policies. I would wait to see 
how this situation uh, works itself through, it may result in, because this is something no one's ever dealt with before, um, you know, during certainly during all of our time. So it could inform policies in the future. But I think for right now, I would just focus on informing employees about the emergency leaves that are currently in place and anything that is available, say, through unemployment, which is another income protection for employees during this time, should you have to furlough them. Okay, and then somebody else asked about um, if employees use workers' comp or unemployment in these situations, which will likely um, result in more usage, will that um, increase the costs or, or cause issues with premiums and such for the employer? Yeah, that's a really good question. I have seen um, different states issuing guidance on that, that they might put a moratorium knowing that there's going to be an influx more likely of unemployment cases um, as to how the insurance will sort of react, insurance areas will react to rates related to workers' compensation. I'm not sure about that, but I'm sure there'll be some guidance put out about that and some limits around that. But I think for unemployment, nothing has yet been issued about all of these employees that are now applying for unemployment. I know part of the Stimulus Act that is now being negotiated in Congress is to shore up unemployment and send funding to different states to help with that. So I'm not sure long term if unemployment rates based on this dip, this huge increase will overall allow states to actually increase their rates because it's such an anomaly and it's an emergency situation. So I think we'll kind of have to wait to see that. But my hope is that it won't. It might slightly to recoup or refill, but I know the federal government will be sort of filling state coffers related to unemployment uh, unemployment insurance and money that the states will have to pay out. So um, I think we'll have to see how the rates might change. Um, but I think in the short term, probably not. I would not expect them to change. Okay. And then we have a question uh, from an employer who is a Virginia employer, but they now have employees teleworking exclusively from D.C. or Maryland in response to this emergency, even if full telework is not regularly allowed. So it's a temporary teleworking. Does the employer now have to follow D.C. laws regarding providing D.C. sick and safe leave? I think it's something we need to look into. It's a really good question. I think there are some regulations that may, where you may have to follow state and some where you might have to follow where your where your office is located. So for example, with unemployment, you know, it could be that, you know, I would file through my state and then it could be that the states reconcile with each other. But I think that's a, that's a really good thing for Eric and I to kind of dig into a little bit. Um, you know, where do you have to follow regulations where you're located? And of course, we all have to follow the federal regulations. And where can you, where do you, where must you follow them based on where your employees live? So we'll do a little um, research and digging on that and we'll get some information out about that. Okay. And then if somebody is on the Families First benefits, can they still receive unemployment benefits? If you're still receiving pay, no, you you have to wait until if you're still receiving pay, and that's going to be up to different states. But my sense is, based on what I know about sort of unemployment, if you're still receiving a pay or some type of a severance or something like that, your your unemployment pay would begin after that paid leave is over. Is what I would. I'm going to double check on that. But my understanding would be once your pay from your employer ends, then you could file for unemployment if you are then furloughed after that period of time. Okay, and then I think we talked about documentation if you needed to be out of the office. Any requirements for allowing an employee to return to work when coming off of this emergency leave after a diagnosis? I mean, what I would require is if they're if they've been diagnosed, there's there could be that either you require a doctor's note to return or ensure that they are following CDC guidelines to self quarantine for at least 14 days and make sure that they don't have any symptoms when they return. So I, I would, as an employer, I would inquire or require a doctor's note to ensure that they're returning um, healthy to work. Um, and just clarification again on the two-thirds payment, you cannot go below the minimum wage. Somebody was confirming that. So if somebody is making $13 an hour, but the minimum wage is $12.50, then is the lowest they can pay the $12.50. Correct. You can't drop below minimum. Okay, great. 
And if you are um, not laid off, but there's no work available as an hourly non-exempt employee, um, can you claim unemployment? If you're not laid off? Yes, but if no work is available. I think if there's no work available, and then if they're not getting pay in any other way from their employer, they really should be furloughed. Um, so to just not be furloughed or not laid off, if there's no work and the employee's not getting paid, I think the it's on the employer, I think, to provide you know documentation that they've been furloughed. Yeah, I wouldn't want to have a situation as an employer where I'm just not giving an employee who's non-exempt work and not paying them and then not giving them sort of the option to identify that, yes, you've been furloughed. Now, of course, if they are not, if you're in a state where you're, you're a non-essential business, then the employee could go, but I would, I think it should be on the employer to, you know, to make sure that the employees understand what their rights are um, under that circumstance. Okay. And then um, will all eligible payments made to employees be reimbursed either through a tax credit or through direct reimbursement? I, I don't want to agree to say all. I mean, what I've been reading is that is the plan. Um, I, I just want to make sure that as we answer the question, um, everyone understands that a lot of this guidance is, is still, like I said, the IRS has just published its initial preview of what they what they plan to do later on. It, it is my understanding that the goal is to make employers whole through this. But, you know, again, wait until the IRS, you know, publishes all of their guidance to, to really be able to stand behind, you know, and say that you would definitely be 100 percent reimbursed i think that's the plan i mean lisa do you do you agree with that or do you, do you... no i do i agree i think they've given very high level it mm -hmm. will either be done by um for those that are on emergency leave by suspending the 6.2 percent social security tax or through the filing of your taxes I think that's the most we know now. And I know, Eric, as you're saying, yes, we'll watch for that guidance as it comes out. But right now, it's those are the only two methods that we know about, the suspension of the Social Security tax for employers receiving, employees receiving payments, and then also uh, through filing in your quarterly taxes for any credits that you might be eligible for as an employer. Okay, and then it looks like more questions on the two-thirds pay. So if an employee is receiving two-thirds of their pay under the Family's First Act, why would they receive at least minimum wage when it is not hours worked? Sorry. You're getting you're getting paid two thirds of your hourly rate. So you know if if the if the two thirds of that rate is below minimum wage, um, they're just kind of kicking in the FLSA there and saying there's never a time where it's okay to pay the employee less than minimum wage. And can you also explain um, again um, because nonprofits don't file taxes? Can you explain um, a little bit better, a little bit sorry, a little bit more about the tax benefit to nonprofits? They don't file taxes. They might be thinking not filing taxes, but these, these are all related to payroll taxes, correct? The, the benefits that they will be receiving. Well, no, the the tax that is get that that gets suspended because yeah, that is correct. Nonprofits don't pay the payroll tax, but they do pay the 6.2% employer social security tax. So that is the tax that gets suspended when an employee is using the emergency, either one of the two emergency benefits or leave benefits. There, as far as getting more guidance on the tax regulations part of it, we're still waiting for more guidance from the IRS. Um, there, that also includes guidance for nonprofits as well. So as soon as we get that guidance about how organizations can apply for those credits, including nonprofits, then we'll, we'll make sure to get that information out. Well, that's our show for today. Thank you for listening in to The Switch. Does your organization need to talk with someone about the topics we covered today? Nonprofit HR is your thought partner for all talent management life cycle needs. We've served the social sector exclusively for more than 20 years. Call us 202-785-2060 or email us for a mini consult, info at nonprofithr.com. Looking for more episodes of The Switch? Visit nonprofithr.com forward slash The Switch and access recordings and resources to help your organization maximize its greatest asset, your 